Good morning. Good morning. Today we are in John chapter 10, which is a series that I started a few months back. So I did get Dan's approval to finish this series. So <clears throat> I realized that he's in John 10, but by the time he comes to this passage, it's going to be probably a few months. So if you wouldn't mind, open your Bibles to John chapter 10. We're going to be looking at verses 11 through 15. John chapter 10, 11 through 15. <clears throat> this is what it says. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a higher hand and not the shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. <clears throat> I usually don't teach anything personal from the pulpit because that's really not you know, relevant, but today I want to tell you a little bit about what happened in my life and my conversion. By the end of uh, the summer of 2016, I was living the American dream. I'm not from around here, as you can tell. Uh, but I was really living the American, American dream. I had a full-time job. I'm here legally. I'm financially independent. I have, you know, my apartment. I have a car. I have, you know, health. So. I have a decent circle of friends, or I thought, and everything is going my way. I think I had anyone, everything that anyone could, could have. Um, so I was very happy with myself. So then <clears throat> I still had something missing in my life. There was something there that I had not achieved yet. And then I thought, I need to go to church. That's what's missing. So I decided I needed to go to church. So I first started attending a Methodist church. Um, for no reason. I just thought this looks like a church and they talk about Jesus. So I didn't know any better. So I went there and I started listening to their messages and, and then I thought, well, I, I need to get a Bible because some people carry a Bible, so I need to carry one. And so I went to Barnes & Noble and I just picked up a Bible, whatever it was. I didn't have any clue of, of what a Bible was. So I picked up one, I had it, but I never opened it, I never read it, but I had it. And I would carry it with me every Sunday when I was going to the services. So. After a few months of attending uh, these activities and these services, I met my wife, who invited me to the chapel. So <clears throat> I started coming to Believer's Chapel, and the very first time I show up, it's a massive struggle, because I walk into this building thinking I am a good person. I am a, you know, almost kind of an example to society. I mean, I am an elementary school teacher, so I'm, I'm a good person. but. Um, the struggle began immediately after the service uh, uh, started because the sermon said that I was not a good person. The, the, the preacher, in this case Dan, was telling me that I was a fallen sinner who had transgressed against a holy and righteous God and that the penalty for my sin was eternal death in hell. So all of a sudden, I realize, or he tells me, that I have an eternal debt with God and that I was utterly incapable of ever paying it. That everything that I thought was good on me was nothing but filthy rags for the Lord, and there was nothing that I could do to gain his anything, his approval, nothing. I was an enemy of God when I thought I was his friend. So, as you can imagine, this was a difficult time for me because he just shattered my whole reality. And then, you know, Wilford doesn't know that, but I want to tell you that the other person that was giving me the punches in the afternoon was Wilford Webb, <laughs> telling, me, well, telling me how he was righteous over and over again, and, and, and I, I did not like that. Who made him righteous? Who told him? So I was determined that Dan Duncan and Mr. Webb were dead wrong, and I was going to prove them wrong. <laughs> so then I started talking to some people, Mr. Newman, one of them, and they kindly pointed me to the scriptures and they said, you need to read the book of John, which is what we're looking at. And then little by little, with the help of men like Mr. Newman and some others, and obviously reading the Bible, I determined that um, they were right and I was wrong, that what I needed was a savior. So <clears throat> the reason I'm saying this is because 
If there's someone here or listening to this message, I want you to understand that, that you do need a savior, that like myself, I have a very high view of myself, but, but we need to view ourselves in the life of scripture and what the savior says. So today we're talking about the savior again. We're talking about this wonderful savior, the good shepherd who said that he lays his life down for the sheep. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So a few months ago, when we began this series in John 10, I had mentioned that this chapter is actually a continuation of chapter 9. If you remember, uh, in chapter 9, Jesus heals this guy that was uh, uh, unable to, to walk from birth. And <clears throat> I mean, no, sorry, not walk. Uh, he was blind from birth. And then he heals him on a Sabbath, and that's a whole thing. And now it is a problem. And the religious authorities of that time decide to excommunicate this formerly bland man. And this excommunication represented a massive problem for this person. And the reason was that the synagogue was at the center of every aspect of their life, whether it was family, work, social, uh, economic, you name it. Everything was happening around the synagogue. So all of a sudden, this man is cast out from the synagogue, and he becomes uh, um, how do you call it? Um, a persona non grata. He's just out in the, in, in the, you know, on his own. So <clears throat> this happened to be the worst possible scenario for this guy. But actually, it wasn't. Because what seemed like a tragedy for him was actually the greatest blessing he could have received. He was thrown out of the synagogue. And, and, and he was thrown right into the arms of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in chapter 10, the Lord is using a parable or a figure of speech of a shepherd and the sheep, which was very familiar for, for these uh, Israelites, uh, to illustrate what happened to the blind man, uh, blind man in chapter 9. So in this chapter, God, uh, the Lord is explaining to the Jews the difference between a false shepherd and a true shepherd. That's, that's how far we have come uh, in our study. Now, the other thing that I had mentioned before I had explained to you a little bit of the characters that were part of this parable. We said that the Lord Jesus is the door of the sheep. We also said that he's the true shepherd. And we said that the religious leaders of the time, which were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes, those were described as the strangers and the thieves that came in the night. And then we also determined that the sheep are all those whom God gave to the Son are those who hear the word of God and come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, which is hopefully all of us here. Now, <clears throat> something I have to mention is that during one of my seminary classes, one of my professors was making a point to the, to, to, to the students saying that, that we are a lot like sheep. So <clears throat> he said that sheep are very prone to wander away carelessly. They don't, they don't really know what they're doing, they just go. And they're just seeking grass, and then they, they, all of a sudden they're, they're way out in the boondocks, away from the flock and away from the shepherd. So this makes them prone to get into trouble easily. And on top of it all, they're helpless animals. They cannot defend themselves, so they're no match for any, any of the predators. So <clears throat> sheep need constant guidance, constant care, constant protection, constant provision, otherwise, they just go and, and get in trouble and, and, and they die. And sometimes the shepherd has to go far to get the sheep. And in some of these occasions, the shepherd has to you know, hurt the sheep by restraining it, dragging it, or just you know, picking it up against its will to bring it back to the, to the fold. And I, and I thought, you know, that, that was me. The Lord had to bring me. And it was a painful experience. But I didn't know it was for my good. But now I do. So that's why it makes sense that we are actually like sheep. So today in this section, we're going to see how the Lord Jesus is explaining the difference between the good shepherd and the hired hand. Now, if you're reading from the New um, King James or the New King James, your Bible doesn't say hired hand. Your Bible says hireling. And I'm going to explain what this word uh, signifies in a moment. So we're, he's going to explain the difference between the good shepherd and the hired hand. So we begin our lesson, finally, in verse 11. And this is the fourth of the seven I am's that the Lord said in John, uh, in, the, in the Gospel of John. 
Now, something really quick that I need to mention, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw some Greek at you, but I think this is important for you to know. And Dr. Ladwig there will probably address me later if I say something wrong. Uh, there's se seven times where the Lord says, ego, a me, which are scriptures, which our Bibles translate as I am. But the idea here is that there is an emphasis on the pronoun I, so uh, uh, there's, an, there's, a, there's an emphasis there that we do not see in the translation in English. And probably it's because there's a, a grammatical issue with, with translating as, as, as they wanted to portray it. So a word-by-word -word translation would say, I and only I am. I explained this, this before, I and I alone. So this, this is how we would translate it. I and I alone am the bread of life. I and I alone am the light of the world. I and I alone am the door of the sheep. And it makes absolute sense because this is only Christ. This is solus Christo, no one but Christ. So he is telling us that he and he alone is these things, and he and he alone is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. So <clears throat> this verse 11 begins with a description of the Lord himself. And, 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 and he says that he is the good shepherd. Now this word, this adjective that is described as, or, or translated as, as, as good is the adjective kalos, which in general is used to describe outward appearance. So it would be something like beautiful or handsome. Uh, however, in this context, the adjective good is to describe an unobjectional moral excellence. So in this case, we would translate it as noble or praiseworthy. So therefore, we could say that Jesus is the beautiful shepherd or the noble shepherd, the praiseworthy shepherd. And this makes absolutely sense because we're speaking about the only begotten Son of God, the Son like no other one of a kind. So if he is the son like no other, he has to be the shepherd like no other. The son is praiseworthy. The shepherd, the good shepherd is also praiseworthy. So <clears throat> Jesus is the one and only shepherd, the shepherd like no other. So <clears throat> this also, if you think about this in Romans, it says that there is no one good, no one that seeks God. Well, there is, Jesus is good because he is seeking God, because he does the things that, that please the Father. He is not part of that section in, in Romans when, when, he's, when, when Paul says there is no one good. Jesus is the only one that is good. And then there's another section where, where it says that who is good? Well, God is good. And so is the good shepherd because he, he himself is God. So it makes absolute sense, at least you know, in my mind. So the moral excellence of the shepherd's character is shown in his work, and the work that he does on behalf of his sheep is, is shown in the fact that he lays down his life for the sheep. And there are here, there are three things that I want you to notice about this phrase. And the first one is that this is a voluntary act. It's a voluntary sacrifice. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, not because it's a requirement, not because, not because he has to do it. He wants to do this. It's voluntarily. This is an act of love. This is not an act of duty. So what we see here is how the good shepherd is different from other shepherds. Now, while it is true that Palestinian shepherds would risk their lives for the sheep, fighting a bear or a lion to protect them, because that's kind of part of their job, they would not intentionally, intentionally sacrifice their life for them. If a shepherd was to be killed by a beast defending the sheep, that was not his intention. That was just a sad incident. The shepherd was not planning to die willingly for the sheep. This would have been a complete accident. That was not the norm. That is the difference between just a regular shepherd and the good shepherd. Now, the second thing that I want, you, uh, I want us to notice here is um, in the phrase that is translated, for the sheep. The phrase in, in Greek is uperton probaton, 
which means actually on behalf of the sheep. That would be probably a better way to translate it. Or instead of the sheep. So the good shepherd lays down his life on behalf of the sheep or for the benefit of the sheep. And what this is describing is the substitutionary atonement of sin. That's why this translation is so important. When you say for the sheep, a more precise way to say it is on behalf of them. So <clears throat> it's a description of the Lord's supreme sacrifice at Calvary for his people. That's what he's telling us here. Jesus is descri describing himself as a substitute for sinners. He takes the place of sinners so that we may be delivered from the penalty of sin. So the third thing in this phrase is that it's, it speaks of a satisfaction. It speaks of a payment of a debt. In this case, the infinite debt that the sheep had with God. It's this infinite debt that I didn't know I had. It's this infinite debt that you do not know about if you have never ever heard the gospel or heard the news of the Bible. So Jesus endures the full wrath of God on behalf of his sheep, on behalf of those who were given to him by the Father. So <clears throat> he does this for the children of God. He does this for true believers. He does this for the elect. He takes the full wrath of God on their behalf. This is how it happened. In the garden, when Adam and Eve fall into sin, Adam is our perfect representative. We could not have done better than Adam. Never, ever. He represents everybody in the human race. When he fell, we all fell with him. And then what happens? Well, sin comes into the world. And then death comes into the world with it. So now the penalty for our sins is eternal death in hell. That's just what it is. It's very unpleasant, especially if you have, heard it, if you have never heard this before. But that is the penalty for our sin. We are personally liable for it. We are under the wrath of God. We are his enemies. So sin must be paid for, either by ourselves or by someone else. Sin is not just going to go away. So then all of a sudden, you have a person like me that is liable, and I am under the wrath of God. So either I take it personally or someone else does, and that some, some other person is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about the Ark of Noah. That, that's exactly what, what it is. Everybody that is chosen by the Lord is inside the ark. The storm is raging outside. It's pouring water from the top, it's rushing from the bottom, and there's waves, and this is being moved left and right, and there's a, the fierceness of a storm. And the, the ark is the one taking all that, all that force, the strong uh, uh, winds and water and everything is striking the ark. And the ark is protecting everyone that is inside. All those who are in the ark are being protected from the wrath that is coming outside. That's, that, that, that's a visual that we need to have. That's what the Lord did. He endured the wrath. And all those who are in him are protected from that wrath. He's taking it for us. So Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, the eternal son of God, who is fully God and fully man, with his sacrifice at the cross, he paid in full the eternal debt that we could never, ever pay. So <clears throat> he bore the penalty that was due to us on our behalf. So <clears throat> this, uh, um, this is how he paid for our sins. This is how, how he did what we couldn't. Going back to the world, the death of a shepherd would have been an absolute disaster for his sheep because the shepherd was in charge not only to protect them, but also to feed them and to care for them. If they, had, if they were hurt, he would mend them. If, if they were hungry, he would take them to a new pasture. If they were in danger, he would, he would make sure that they were taken care of. At night, he would put them in the, in the sheepfold. So the, the, the shepherd was instrumental in the life of the sheep, and, and losing your shepherd would mean disaster for the sheep. On the other hand, the death of the good shepherd it's actually the best thing that could ever have happened to us because with the death of the good shepherd, his sheep were able to live, to live eternally. This had to happen. So as I mentioned earlier, 
the Lord Jesus had already compared his enemies to strangers and thieves. He said they were strangers because they did not know the sheep, and they were thieves because they sought to steal the sheep and carry them away with violence. All right? So that's the difference, you know, with, 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 uh, with the bad guys. They want to take with not a good intention, and they want to do it violently. There is no care here. There is only uh, uh, terror. On the other side, Jesus uh, uh, compares the, the, the higher hand or the hireling, uh, uh, if you're reading the King James, with the good shepherd. Now, let me, let me tell you about this word hireling. Hireling, according to the dictionary, is, is a mercenary. That, that's pretty much what it is. That's the idea here in this word. So that's, I would prefer that, that it only appears in the King James as a hireling. It's someone that is a mercenary. They're in it for the money, as we're going to see in a minute. So <clears throat> in the verses 12 and, and 13, the Lord says, He who is a higher hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hireling or a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. So, <clears throat> so I was saying, this, this, has, this hireling, this hired hand, has mercenary motives. And what the Lord is telling us here in these verses is that these false shepherds are not at all concerned about the well-being of the sheep. If the sheep is healthy, if it dies or if it lives, I do not care about it. All they care about is money. What am I going to get paid for doing, uh, uh, doing this job? So <clears throat> these men will care for the sheep only when they were on the job, and they're just seeking to get their paycheck. The sheep is not my concern. I don't care if they eat well. I don't care anything. I mean, I'm just, I'm just here for the money, and, and, and that's all that's always going to happen. If, if, things are, if, if things are okay, I'll do it, and if it gets too dangerous, I'm out of here. So. <clears throat> In this case, if they saw the wolf coming their way, and they know that there's him in the danger, they would just abandon the sheep and leave, flee. That's what the Lord's describing. And the sad result of, of this uh, lack of compromise or care or love for the sheep is that the wolf would come, and they would take some of the sheep, and those sheep would be lost, and the rest of them would be obviously scattered in a, in a panic. So this, 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 was, this was awful for the sheep. They would run in all directions. They would be scattered. Then in contrast, the good shepherd uh, protects the sheep, making sure that no one is able to snatch them out of his hand. He lays down his life for the sheep. He doesn't flee. He stays. And he lays down his life for those whom he loved. And he does it willingly. He does it without any condition. He does it without any hesitation. He does, does it willingly and happily. That's the difference. So the good shepherd never scatters his sheep. On the contrary, he's seeking to get them all together. He wants to keep them together. He wants to protect them. He wants to provide for them. He wants to be with them. So, <clears throat> so that's the example that we have in the scriptures. But you might be asking, especially my youth here, well, how does that look in real life? Okay, I understand, you know, he's a good shepherd and he protects them, but how does that look here in Dallas, Texas? Well, let me explain it like this. <clears throat> the hired hand or the hireling would be one of those pastors, which sadly, sadly there are many around the country, who are more concerned about their popularity and their own personal wealth. And, 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 and they preach the gospel of Jesus Christ just for gain. So they're not really concerned about giving you the gospel. They're just concerned about how much money you bring to my church so that I can put it in my bank account. So these men care nothing about God. They care nothing about his word. They care nothing about his people. All they care about is their, their pocket, their checkbook. So the wolf now, so that would be the, 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 the hireling. The wolf, the enemy, of course, is Satan and the evil world system that surrounds us. And this evil system, it's now very liberal and very radical with ideas that go contrary to the word of God. That's why, that's why you, you, you know these are radical. These are completely antithetical to what the Lord says in his word. They're liberal because they think that you and I are subjugated by the scriptures and by an oppressive God. 
and that's not the case, but, but these ideas are influencing everything around us, whether it's the economy or politics, education, culture, fashion, sports, entertainment, you name it, even churches. So <clears throat> there is virtually no aspect in our lives that is not influenced by the world and this liberal and progressive agenda. So <clears throat> the enemy, of course, is working very hard and succeeding to seduce people with a false message of love and inclusion and tolerance. This is not what scripture says about love and inclusion and tolerance. This is what they think it should be. This is what they would want it to be. And what does the hireling do with all these things that are floating around and impacting the people? They abandon the sheep. How does that look like? Well, instead of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, instead of preaching the message, message of salvation that is contained in the scriptures, instead of doing that, which is what we need, they manipulate the gospel to make it acceptable to the world, to become friends with the world. They would massage the truth. They will you know, withhold the truth. So all is in an effort to be friends with the world. And the problem with this is that this is a message that is good for the world, but it's poison for the sheep. These false preachers, these false pastors, preach according to the spirit of the age, according to the desires of sinful people, and not according to the holy word of God. Their message is based on myths and fantasies, and not on sound biblical doctrine. That's how this looks like in real life. So <clears throat> their fear... Their fear is to be rejected by the world. So <clears throat> instead of condemning sin as they should, they embrace it. They normalize it. They tell you it is perfectly fine to have more than one gender. We should embrace them. We should bring them as they are. They tell you this is an act of love. But what does the Lord say about that? They don't tell you that. So, so that's, that's what it is. They do not condemn sin as they should. They do not preach the gospel. That is what we need. They seek to please the world instead of God. And about this, <clears throat> a few years back, Dr. Johnson, when he was preaching this message, he made a statement in relation to these hirelings, and he said this, that is one reason why I hope in Believer's Chapel, as long as this church exists, that from the pulpit shall be preached the pure gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. May there never be any hireling preachers who stand behind the pulpit here. That's what Dr. Johnson said. I don't know how, how long ago he preached this message, but that's what he said. And that stuck with me. And I thought, I need to mention this because uh, this is a sobering reminder, especially for those of us who are newer in teaching the scriptures, that preaching is a serious business. The call to preach is a great privilege, and it's, all, it's an even greater responsibility, especially in our times, because there are souls as, at stake so for you, that are our audience, that are the sheep, it's very important. We mentioned this the other day at a meeting. We need to be reading the Bible. We need to know what the Bible says so that I don't stand here and try to sell you an idea that is not in the scriptures. So you have the responsibility of reading the word for yourself so that you can determine whether I'm telling you the truth or not. And if I am not, you need to chase me out of here. That's what Dr. Johnson said. That's what we need to do with everybody that steps in this pulpit. So, so that's what you need to do. You need biblical truth and not my opinions, not my feelings, not my adventures. You don't care about those. You care about what the Word says. That's what you need to ask for. That's what we are here to do, what I'm hoping to do. And then for all of us who have been called to preach, like the clergy over here to my left, <laughs> We need to remember what Paul told, to, told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. He says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction, for the time will come, and here's where we are today, when they will not endure sound doctrine but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth 
and we'll turn aside to myths. That is exactly where we are right now. That is the illustration that I was talking to you about. But you, Timothy, be sober in all things. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. So <clears throat> may the Lord give us the faith and the knowledge and the courage to actually and faithfully proclaim his word by reading it, by studying it, by knowing it, and making sure that we're not deceived. And finally, in verses 14 and 15, the Lord said, I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. So in these verses, there are a couple of things that I need you to notice. And the first one is that Jesus declares once again that he and he alone is the good shepherd. The good shepherd knows his sheep, and they know him because they belong to him. That's how they know him. We talked about this before, how the shepherd of the sheep calls. And among all the sheep, those who are his actually respond to his voice because they hear his voice, they know who he is. It's like a mother calling for his children. In a room full of kids, they know the voice of their mom. It's the same thing, same thing with, this, with this shepherd. When he calls his sheep, out of many, his will come. The others will ignore. So he knows his sheep, sheep because they belong to him. And they know him because they know he is their owner. And this shepherd takes care of them. He provides for them. He protects them. He's always watching over them. Why? Well, because he's getting paid. No, it's not because he's getting paid. It's because he loves them. There is an intimate relationship between them. And the key here is love. The good shepherd loves his sheep. The other shepherd is just there for the money. There is no love. There is duty. It's a completely different thing. So <clears throat> there is an intimate relationship between them. In fact, the good shepherd loves them so much that he's willing to lay down his life for them. I think that the, most, the closest example that I can come up with is the motherly love. A mother would give her life for her children. But a mom, a lot of moms here, would not just give her life for a child, but they would do it for their child. That's what the Lord is saying here. So <clears throat> that's the first thing. The second thing to notice here is that the knowledge that exists between the good shepherd and his sheep is complete. He knows each and every one of us by name. He knows our likes and dislikes. He knows our fears. He knows our desires, our strengths, our weaknesses. There is nothing that he does not know about our lives. He knows our hearts and he knows our minds. That's a comforting thought and that's a scary thought. He knows everything that is going on in your mind and in your heart right now, obviously. So there is nothing that he does not know about us, past, present, and future. He knows everything. So he says, my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. Now, let me tell you what this does not mean. This does not mean that the fellowship between the good shepherd and the sheep is just as close as the fellowship between the Father and the Son. That's of, of course, it's impossible. Their relationship is eternal, it is perfect, and it's far beyond of the relationship that we can have with God, because we're finite. What this actually means is that our relationship with Jesus Christ is a reflection of the relationship that the Father has with, our son, with the Son. It's, our relationship is modeled after this relationship that Father and Son have. So our intimacy with the Savior is grounded upon the intimacy between the Father and the Son. That's what this means, <clears throat> which I will take. You know, this is, this, is just, this is just the way it should be. So, <clears throat> if you're here without Christ, unfortunately, like me, many years ago, you're a sheep without a shepherd, and you're standing on a field away from the flock, unprotected and vulnerable, and defenseless. You're hopelessly lost, and you don't even know it, like I did not know it. And you feel secure because you're surrounded by other sheep who are equally lost, but everybody seems to be happy. 
They're alive. They're eating. They're enjoying themselves. There's no clouds in the sky. Everything is beautiful. Everything is fine. and Everything is peaceful. And then with these other sheep, you have been able to convince each other that everything is just fine. There's not a problem in the world. You just have absolutely nothing to fear. You just carry on with your life and be, be happy. You think you don't need protection and provision. You don't need a shepherd because so far I made it on my own. I'm perfectly fine. I have every need taken care of. So why would I need a protector or a provider? So <clears throat> the reality, though, is that you're in imminent danger. You're beginning to run out of daylight. Life is going away. Every day on earth is one day less that you have. So darkness is coming. Soon, you'll be engulfed in the dark, and predators are beginning to awake. And soon, they will be lurking around, seeking someone to devour. And a sheep, and a lost sheep, like one of those who is without Christ, is no match for a wolf like Satan. And the only hope for your survival is to run to the Good Shepherd. He is the only one that can protect you from certain death. He is the only one that can pay the eternal debt that you could never, ever pay. And he says, all those who come to me, I will not reject. He, in fact, invites you to come and come today to receive the forgiveness that you need. Jesus Christ is that Savior. He is the bread of life. He is the light of the world. Him and Him alone is the door to salvation. Him and Him alone is the door into eternal life. Christ and Christ alone is the good shepherd who lays down His life on behalf of the sheep. The good shepherd is gathering His sheep at this very moment. He wants us to come to Him in order to receive this forgiveness from our sins. So the question, if you're here without Christ, is will you come to him today and receive this gift of salvation and eternal life that only he can offer. You need to do that today because you do not know when would be your last moment. And for all of us here who have actually trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ and we are certain that he is our Savior, we need to praise him. We need to get to know him better by reading the Word of God. That's all we need to do. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for the blessing that it is to be able to preach this message, to know about the goodness and the mercy and the, all the eternal attributes of your Son. Lord, we thank you for him who died at the cross on behalf of sinners like us. We ask you, Lord, that if there's anyone listening to this message, that they would um, receive a new heart, that they may be able to place their faith on our Lord Jesus Christ and receive the salvation that they need. We thank you, Lord, for our Lord Jesus Christ, and in his name we pray. Amen.